Hello, everyone. This is the lecture on the transition of Israel from the period of the judges to the monarchy. And it centers on the figure of King David. He lies at the center of the whole passage of Israel's history that we'll be looking at today. But it marks a significant transition from Israel's existence as a federation of tribes under the leadership of Moses and then the judges to a nation, to a geopolitical entity with a king and with borders and with regional influence. And the central figure around this whole transition is King David. Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our minds with the light of your truth, fill our hearts with the fire of your love. Move us from where we are, change us from who we are, guide us to where you want us to be, and transform us into the likeness of God. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So we were assigned a selection of passages from First and Second Samuel, and also the sixth chapter of Dominique Bartholomew's book, God in His Image. I'll be commenting on some more chapters from these two books, from the whole story of King David. Uh, but again, on this first slide, you have all of the chapters that you were responsible for reading, what I thought were the most significant or pivotal chapters. Okay, so let's get to the story. The story of King David, really begins with an ordinary woman who prays. This whole story of Israel's transition to a people, a nation with a king, is set in motion by a woman in Israel who prays for a child. And I wanted to highlight her in particular because prayer plays an essential role in this whole story that we're going to be looking at. If you look at the story of First and Second Samuel and pick out the points where prayer is mentioned or highlighted, it always has a transformative effect, and it's usually a turning point in the story. So the story begins with the turning point where this woman by the name of Hannah, who is the wife of an ordinary Israelite by the name of Elkanah, prays for a child because she is childless. So in ancient Israel, to be married and without a child is in a sense to be incomplete. Children were seen as a kind of crown or completion of one's mission in the world. Remember the command that God gave to both Adam and Eve and to Noah, be fruitful and multiply. The Israelites took this as a command that applied to everyone. And so to be without a child is, in a sense, to be uh, incomplete, not to have fulfilled this commandment that God had given. And so she was filled with a sense of deep sorrow and misery and cried out to the Lord for a child. And specifically, she prayed for a son. And so she went to the tabernacle, the holy place, the tent where the Holy of Holies was, the Ark of the Covenant, and the priests offered the sacrifices. And chapter one says that she pours her heart out to the Lord. This is also something I wanted to highlight here. It's not only prayer as in the filing of a petition, but prayer as in an outpouring of the heart from the deepest place of one's existence and identity, one shares what is on one's mind and heart to the Lord. So she asks for a son, and as a condition for this request, or maybe even incentive to God, she promises to dedicate this son to the Lord. She says that if your handmaid is given a male child, I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and he will be specifically dedicated to God and will actually live in the temple all the days of his life that he can. So after the child, well, at first, when she's saying this prayer, a priest at the tabernacle sees her. 
And in the Jewish tradition, it's interesting. Prayer is always meant to be audible. You're not really praying unless you yourself can hear yourself pray. But it says that Hannah was praying silently, but that her lips were moving. So she was doing something with her body to pray, and perhaps she could hear herself pray, but Eli is looking at this woman and just seeing her lips move, and he thought she was drunk. And so she explained to him that she's praying for this child. She doesn't have one yet, and if God gives her a son, that she will dedicate it to the Lord by giving this child to the priests at the tabernacle. And so Eli responds, may the God of Israel grant what you have requested. And so her prayers answered, and Hannah bears a son. And this is the first transformation or turning point in the story because Samuel, who plays an instrumental role throughout, is born. So Hannah names her son Samuel. And after he is weaned, she follows through and brings him to the temple. It says the temple in the story, but it can be a little bit confusing because at this point, what we know as the temple today, the, the grand building that Solomon built and that was then rebuilt after the Babylonian exile is not yet in existence. It's still the wilderness tabernacle that is set up in a place in Israel called Shiloh. She takes Samuel there and gives him to the priests who live there and who operate the uh, sacrifices at the tabernacle. So Eli accepts Samuel and the child enters into the tabernacle where corruption is rife. So here's a child sent by God, an innocent child of prayer, and he enters into this place where the priests are stealing the best portions of the sacrifices and are defiling the uh, acts of worship there. And so you have this contrast, this tension. God is doing something to intervene in the corruption of the uh, priest at the time, particularly Eli's sons. Eli, the priest, is uh, not the one really responsible for these um, acts of desecration. It's his sons who are really um, uh, doing these um, deeds that are displeasing to the Lord, as we'll see. So when Hannah gives Samuel to the temple, she says this beautiful prayer in 1 Samuel 2, and it is extremely poetic and important in the Christian tradition, as perhaps you'll see. And I want to read a little bit of it to you today to give you a sense of what sort of prayer First and Second Samuel regard as a prayer from the heart. She pours out her heart again to the Lord by saying, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted by my God, meaning my bounty, my uh, possessions, all that I have. I have swallowed up my enemies. I rejoice in your victory. And then a little later, the bows of the mighty are broken while the tottering gird on strength. The well-fed hire themselves out for bread while the hungry no longer have to toil. The Lord makes poor and makes rich, humbles and also exalts. He raises the needy from the dust, from the ash heap, lifts up the poor. You get a sense that she herself was, play, was in the position of the poor, the needy, the tottering, and now she's vindicated, the Lord has answered her, and the tables have turned upon those who are rich. Uh, and she goes on to say, he guards the footsteps of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall perish in the darkness. For not by strength does one prevail. The Lord judges the ends of the earth. May he give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. So here you have the first mention of a king or the king in 1 Samuel. And we know that it isn't God himself because she's praying that the Lord or God would give strength to his king. So who is this king? Israel at this point has no king. So it's interesting. It's almost like a prophecy or foretelling of what will happen. And later in the New Testament, Our Lady, the Blessed Virgin Mary, echoes Hannah's prayer 
in the exaltation that she gives after she visits her cousin Elizabeth uh, in the first chapter of Luke. And this is the prayer that Catholics refer to as the Magnificat. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he's looked with favor on his lowly servant. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel, for he's remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to Abraham and his children forever. It's very similar. I mean, it is uh, extraordinary, uncanny, how similar Mary's Magnificat is to Hannah's prayer of exaltation in chapter 2. And uh, it's of the same form, too, where the poor are lifted up, the rich are cast down, the tables have turned, and God is vindicating those who have been uh, oppressed and who have gone without. Okay, so Samuel is uh, raised in the temple, and there's this interesting story where when he's a boy, he's sleeping in the tabernacle precinct. Uh, and he hears a voice. And he's confused at first, and so he runs to the priest Eli, thinking that it was Eli who was speaking to him. And it seems clear from the text that he was being called by name. Eli's confused because he must have been sleeping. He said, well, I didn't, I didn't call you. Samuel does this several times until Eli says, when you hear this voice speaking your name, reply, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening which is rather insightful on his part. Uh, he recognized that the Lord perhaps was speaking to him, calling him by name, which the Lord has done before, particularly with um, Abraham and with Moses. And so Eli tells Samuel how to reply to this voice that he's hearing. So when Samuel does reply this way to the Lord, the Lord gives Samuel this bombshell message, which specifically has very negative ramifications for Eli. He's basically saying that he sees what Eli and his sons are doing, and that he's condemning Eli and his house, and that he's no longer going to recognize Eli or his sons as legitimate, valid priests, and he will no longer listen to their prayers and no longer receive their sacrifices. And so Samuel, understandably, uh, hides this message from Eli as long as he can until Eli says, please just tell me what the Lord said. Samuel tells him, and Eli receives it and says, well, the Lord will do what the Lord will do. So he kind of accepts uh, the rebuke, and it turns out that um, uh, things unfold uh, as the Lord said they would. And it's Samuel who comes to be the Lord's favored one, his messenger in Israel. He is really the last judge, in a way. He's the last to stand in this line of those who um, occupy the role of both leader and prophet at the same time. But he also takes on a particular character that um, leads, most, leads a lot of scholars to say he's the first prophet because he's not a judge because he leads the people in battle so much, or even because he decides legal cases, but because primarily he's delivering messages of the Lord to those in power. God is speaking through him, and usually in ways that challenge what the people in power are doing, and so he's often regarded as the first prophet. But he's like a judge, because the same cycle that we see in the book of Judges recurs under his watch. Uh, under Samuel, you have the people turning away and sinning, breaking faith with the Lord's covenant, the desecration of the sacrifices in the tabernacle, and then that is shortly followed by the Philistines defeating the Israelites and actually stealing the Ark of the Covenant. Let me pause briefly here to uh, recount a story in here that's rather remarkable. So the Philistines take the ark back to uh, their hometown of Ashdod on the uh, coast, and they put it in their temple to their favored god, Dagon, D-A-G-O-N. And so the ark is in this temple of their god, and each morning when the Philistines wake up and go into their temple, they find the statue of Dagon 
face down on the ground. And so they put the statue back up the next day, face down on the ground. They put the statue back up and then one day they find it face down on the ground with its uh, hands and feet shattered and it <laughs> damaged beyond repair. And so it says from that day on, nobody entered into this temple anymore. And then to top it off, the Lord sends a, a plague ravaging the Philistines and afflicting the city and its vicinities with tumors. So the Philistines quickly realize that it's because the Ark of the Covenant is in their town that they're being cursed in this way. And so they eventually give the Ark back and you can understand why they would. It's going to kill us all, they thought. And so uh, they return the Ark of the Covenant and then eventually the people recognize their unfaithfulness they fast. Samuel offers sacrifice on behalf of the people. So Samuel, the judge, who's raised up by the Lord, leads the people back to a faithful relationship with the Lord. And then they defeat the Philistines. In chapter seven, they completely uh, rout them. Uh, by the Lord's intervention, it says the Lord thundered loudly and threw them into such confusion that they were defeated by Israel. And so you have uh, the whole cycle there. Uh, arriving back at a place of uh, faithfulness and prosperity. And it says that Samuel serves as a judge for his whole life and that he's a good judge and he rules the people well, but he eventually grows old. And as he's coming to the end of his life, the people are wondering, well, if Samuel's a good judge, but who's going to come after him? So they're anxious about succession. There's a sense in which there's a clear kind of uh, uneasiness with who will lead them after Samuel is gone. And it's exacerbated by the fact that Samuel's sons don't follow his example. I found that interesting because the people here apparently don't see the pattern that's come before, which is namely that the judge the Lord raises up for the people isn't a matter of who the judge is related to, but it's God's specific choice. So Samuel's sons accept bribes. It says they pervert justice. And so the people don't want them as their leader. And so what they what do they do? They gather together and they ask for a king. So here's the, the stipulated reason, at least in the story of why the people request a king. And so they get one. But both Samuel and the Lord himself are not happy with this request. They are displeased and they warn the people about kings and what they will do. Samuel is upset, so he, he goes to the Lord and prays. Here again, prayer. There's a turning point here. Samuel turns to the Lord in prayer, offers his what's on his heart to the Lord. And the Lord says, listen to what the people say. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. They're rejecting me as their king. And so the Lord says, well, you have to warn them, though, give them fair warning about what a king will do and how the king will basically lead them back to a state of slavery that's similar to what they experienced in Egypt. So how would this be the case? Well, Samuel goes through the ways in chapter eight. He says, the king will conscript your sons for his army, take them to war, he'll appoint commanders over you and force you to farm the land and make weapons for, the, for him. And that particularly should have resonated with them because that's how the Pharaoh, who didn't know Joseph, got control of the, of the Israelites. They, he appointed commanders over them and then forced them to work and reduced them to hard slavery and then eventually started killing them. So the king is going to appoint commanders over you, just like the Egyptians. And he will appropriate your daughters, your lands, your, your produce from your fields. He'll take your servants into his household. He'll take a portion of your flocks and your livestock. So I don't know whether this is taxation or just like an eminent domain sort of thing. It's unclear, but he's warning the people, the king is going to take from you what he wants. And as for you, Samuel concludes, you will become his slaves. So again, we see slavery here and the Lord is displeased about it. And anything that would possibly lead to slavery, anything that would go in this direction, the Lord resists. So the people, though, are unmoved by Samuel. They persist in their demand and say, no, there must be a king over us. We too must be like all the nations. 
So they're looking around, maybe a little peer pressure here. Maybe they see the people around them. They're more secure. They're more advanced. They're more prosperous. We want to be like them. We don't constantly be depending on divine intervention all the time. We want to have some power of our own. And so the Lord relents. Samuel goes in search of a king. And the Lord points out this man named Saul. And Saul is initially described as just the most imposing, attractive, and alluring person around. But it's really a matter of appearance. It says that there's none more handsome, that he stood head and shoulders over the people. But the Lord does confirm through Samuel that Saul is his pick. When Samuel caught sight of Saul, it says in chapter 9, the Lord assured him, meaning Samuel, this is the man I told you about. He shall govern my people. So Samuel takes Saul aside and pours oil over his head from a horn. And this was the sign of coronation. This is what it means to anoint somebody in the Bible, pouring oil over their head. Just keep that in mind. It may seem very strange now. But to be anointed is to have oil just doused over you. And the main symbol here is that the Lord's Spirit is coming over you and sticking to you like oil does. And maybe the oil was scented and it kind of marks you. Samuel pours oil over Saul's head and kisses him as a blessing. And so uh, the people recognize Saul. And Samuel presents all to the people and says, the Lord, the Lord anoints you ruler over his people, Israel. You are the one who will govern the Lord's people and save them from the power of their enemies all around them. So Saul's reign begins rather auspiciously. Uh, it, it looks promising. He wins many battles. He establishes security, stability, a more centralized organization of the people. But he eventually loses favor with the Lord by a few missteps or transgressions, particularly breaking faith with the law. So while things go well for a time, he has victories. The people are blessed, They're going in the right direction. But in the midst of these victories, as so often happens, Saul takes matters into his own hands. He presumes that it's really him and his genius that's doing it. And so the Lord ultimately rejects him as king. So what does he do? Well, there's a passage in chapter 13 where Samuel uh, is about to do battle with the Philistines. And before he does battle, he wants to offer sacrifice to the Lord. And he has to do this through Samuel, sort of the recognized messenger the prophet and the uh, priest at the time. And, um, and that's interesting. So in Samuel, we'll have the, the prophet and the priest combined. Uh, but Samuel's late. Samuel's late to the battle. And so Saul gets anxious, takes matters into his own hands, and offers the sacrifice himself. And it's interesting that in response to this, Samuel reproves Saul and says, <clears throat> Had you kept the command the Lord your God gave you, the Lord would now establish your kingship in Israel forever. But now your kingship shall not endure. You have acted foolishly. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart to appoint as ruler over his people because you do not observe what the Lord commanded you. So namely, wait for Samuel to offer sacrifice. Um, the second incident, so there's already this promise through Samuel that the Lord is taking the kingship from Saul, but it becomes crystal clear after Saul disobeys the command to put the Amalekites under the ban, meaning to wipe them all out, everyone, every animal, everything. Uh, it was sort of a scorched earth command. And Saul decides that he's going to spare the king and some of the best spoils from the Amalekites. And, you know, why let it go to waste? So share it with the people, have the king as kind of a trophy of victory. And this angers Samuel. It angers the Lord. And so in chapter 15, uh, Samuel makes things crystal clear. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, the Lord has rejected you as king. He says this at least twice. 
And Saul seems to get it this time. Saul admitted to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the command of the Lord and your instructions. I feared the people and obeyed them, kind of like Aaron did. Uh, so the favor of the Lord, his, his selection of Saul as king, and therefore his legitimacy as king is taken away. And Samuel then goes and looks for a new king. And he's being guided by the Lord to find the one the Lord has chosen. And he finds him in a most unexpected place. The Lord sends Samuel to uh, the household of a man named Jesse who lives in a town called Bethlehem. And I'll just mention as an, as an aside here, it's, it's important, but I can't go into it. The town Bethlehem in Hebrew means house of bread. Bethlehem, uh, Beth means house, uh, Lehem is bread. And so it's interesting that David, the King David, comes from this town called House of Bread. Okay, so Samuel comes to the household of Jesse, the first son that he looks at, this is in chapter 16, is, seems the most promising. Uh, this is, um, Oh, I forget his name, Eliab, I think it is. And he sees this handsome guy and immediately says, oh, that must be him. And the Lord says, no. And it's interesting that he gives a reason for this. Do not judge from his appearance or from his lofty stature, because I have rejected him. God does not see as a mortal who sees the appearance. The Lord looks into the heart. So prayer, heart. These are really two key themes in first and second Samuel. The Lord wants somebody who not just who not only looks the part, but has the heart that he wants. And who is able to enter into this relationship, this dialogue with the Lord from the deepest part of who he is. So Jesse goes on to present seven of his sons, and to each one, the Lord says, No, that's not him. No, not him. And finally, Jesse says, well, are these all the sons that you have? And Jesse reluctantly says, no, there's one, the youngest son, out tending sheep. And Jesse says, well, go get him. Call him back. And so they do. And when he shows up, it says that um, he was ruddy, a youth with beautiful eyes and good looking. It's interesting they still mention good looking. But in any case, the Lord said, there anoint him, this is the one. So then Samuel, with his horn of oil in his hand, anoints David in the midst of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David. And so in a sense, even though this is secret, even though it's not going to be recognized pretty much by anyone, it was just witnessed by David's family, David is already king because the Lord has chosen him, anointed him with his spirit. He is the chosen, selected king to succeed Saul. So God's pathway of legitimacy is a little bit different than the official political path, but there you have it set in motion here with David's anointing. So the first, uh, the, well, the way that David's interaction with Saul begins is that David is called into Saul's service in order to calm him down and play music for him. So I, I really sort of see it as sort of a music therapy. David is known for being a talented musician, a harpist. And Saul, it says, after the Lord's spirit was taken away from him, he was um, sent an evil spirit by the Lord. And it's hard to know what to make of that. So why would an evil spirit come from the Lord? Or sometimes it says the evil spirit of the Lord. And so you wonder, well, what, what, what is this? Um, and sort of, it would be an interesting psychological study to really think through exactly what that would be. But Saul was tormented, and it really is almost a picture of descending into mental illness, certainly into paranoia. So he was anxious. You almost get the sense that he had, was having panic attacks. And so his advisor said, well, why don't we send for somebody who can play music for you and help you to feel better? And so David is selected. Somebody knew that he was a skillful harpist and also a brave warrior and an able speaker and a handsome young man, it says. And so the Lord is certainly with him. And so they send for David. He's brought into the king's service to play the harp for him. It says David would take the harp and play, and Saul would be relieved and feel better. 
So David is his music therapy at first, but he gains favor with Saul and eventually comes to be his armor bearer. So his squire or, you know, his assistant, his valet almost. And he goes with Saul into battle. One of the battles he goes into is a battle with the Philistines, this age-old enemy. And here we have the story of David and Goliath. So David is still quite young. And he is accompanying the king in this battle, which reaches a standoff. And at this point, the Philistines send in their champion, so their best warrior, who issues a challenge to Israel, and this is Goliath. Goliath is said to be nine feet, nine inches tall, it says six cubits and a span, and that equates to over nine feet, almost 10 feet tall. I wonder if this is hyperbole. I mean, that's a tall guy. Fully decked out in armor, you know, completely jacked, full of muscle, and it must have been quite an imposing sight. And Goliath taunts Israel and says, send someone out to fight me and let it be a winner-take-all battle. If they can defeat me, then all the Philistines will become your vassals or your, your, your slaves, basically, your subordinates. And if our champion defeats your champion, then you will become our vassals or servants. So everyone's scared. No one volunteers. David, though, kind of flaps his jaw. You know, he's on the sidelines, and he's, you almost get sense he's muttering to himself, saying, oh, you know, who's this guy I think he is? You know, who's this big oaf over there? And uh, by the way, what is the reward for killing him? So it's a little bit of a braggadocio here or sideline comments. I mean, a young kid who's the armor bearer is commenting basically on why nobody's doing anything about this uh, Philistine who is cursing the Israelite army, cursing Israel's God, and David can't stand it. He wants to get out there. You know, he, he must be stirred. Uh, by the taunts of Goliath, and so he volunteers. And they take him and put him in the best armor they have. But David says, no, that's not how I'm going to win this battle. It just, it just weighs me down. It's too uh, bulky and unwieldy. And so all I need is some smooth stones from the stream and my sling. I don't need any armor. I don't need any swords. So that's how he goes out. It must have been quite the sight, this short little kid against this 10-foot giant, and all he has is a sling and some rocks. And, you know, Goliath has his spear and his sword and his helmet and all his armor. And Goliath kind of laughs at him and says, like, am I a dog that you would come out and face me with, with no armor and, and only a sling? David gives it right back to him now and says, I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. He says, I am going to strike you down so that the whole land shall learn that Israel has a God. All this multitude too shall learn that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle belongs to the Lord, who shall deliver you into our hands. So he says, you're going to lie down on the field and be food for all the animals that come get you. I mean, David really gets it back into him. So there's this trash talking session between the two of them. And then finally, they rush at each other. And before Goliath can get to David, David takes one of the stones, hurls it at Goliath, and it hits Goliath right in the forehead. And it says that the stone embeds itself into his forehead, and he goes down. And it's implied that he's knocked unconscious because then David finishes the deed by cutting off his head. Now, who knows if he's already dead by the stone or not, but David completely uh, immobilizes Goliath and then kills him. So this is, of course, where we get the David and Goliath trope, which is brought out all the time in sports these days. So this was David's first great public act. And it will eventually lead to him becoming the acknowledged king of Israel. But this just troubles Saul all the more. So, you know, Saul has some anxiety, paranoia issues to begin with. And now he has this bright 
rising star, oh, who, by the way, was secretly already anointed king of Israel. But uh, one thing that's interesting is David, when he enters back into the service of Saul, develops a bond of friendship with Jonathan, Saul's son. Jonathan becomes his friend. And it's really a moving description of the friendship. By the time David finished speaking with Saul, Jonathan's life became bound up with David's life. He loved him as his very self. So a real friend, Jonathan's life becomes bound up with David's. David sees him as and loves him as his very self. Deep, deep friendship with Saul's son, Jonathan. But at the same time, a growing rift with Saul, who becomes increasingly envious and jealous of David. This is exacerbated. I mean, the fuel on the fire is this chant, which was chanted by the women in the triumphal processions or parades of the time, who would chant uh, in song, Saul has slain his thousands, David his tens of thousands. So they're basically giving David orders of magnitude more credit for Israel's victories than Saul. Saul sees this as a slight, and it incenses him and makes him more and more jealous and paranoid of David. Uh, Saul descends into rage. He conspires against David. He becomes increasingly fearful of him, and eventually he snaps and goes after him. He tries to kill David chases him around, and David flees. David runs away from Saul, and there are some interesting incidents where uh, Saul is in a vulnerable position. He's either, you know, going to the bathroom in a cave, or sleeping, David comes upon him, has the opportunity to kill him, but doesn't. But he always sort of preserves or leaves a, a sign to Saul that he could have killed him, and it just toys with Saul all the more. And the whole um, paranoia and descent of Saul kind of climaxes with Saul's visit to a witch, the witch at Endor. This is really, I think, the only time a witch is explicitly mentioned in the Bible. This soothsayer, this medium, Saul asks her to conjure up the spirit of Samuel, who by this time had died. Samuel comes and is really perturbed that he's been disturbed in the underworld. And reiterates to Saul, look, I already told you once, your kingdom is taken away. And just for good measure, for calling me out from the land of the dead, you shall fall in battle. You're doomed. And sure enough, the next day when Saul goes into battle, his army is defeated. Three of his sons die, including Jonathan. And Saul is grievously wounded with an arrow. And he doesn't want to fall into the hands of his enemies and be tortured. He doesn't want his body to be uh, paraded everywhere. And so he asks his armor bearer to kill him before the uh, Philistines can. But his armor bearer is afraid and doesn't do it. And so Saul kills himself. He falls on his sword. Okay, so you would think, okay, David has this thorn in his side removed. You think he would have been relieved. And when the people tell him that Saul is dead, you know, as if they would be rewarded for that, the opposite happens. David is deeply grieved. And throughout the whole um, tension and fight between David and Saul, David always recognizes Saul as God's legitimate anointed leader and says, I'm not going to lay a hand on you, Saul, because you are the Lord's anointed. What to make of that? I mean, he's already been anointed. But David, instead of celebrating Saul's death or just, you know, erasing Saul from the history of Israel, composes this beautiful hymn in 2 Samuel. So now we're into 2 Samuel chapter 1. It's called the Song of the Bow. It's a, um, a eulogy, a tribute to Saul, trying to commemorate him as a uh, a great leader of Israel, the first king. And so he marks the occasion by um, commemorating and praising Saul. What follows, though, isn't a smooth transition of power. You have the first Israelite civil war after Saul's death because Saul's death leaves a power vacuum. There are some tribes in the north who side with Saul's son Ishbaal, 
his uh, remaining son, and they want him to be king. The tribes of Judah and Benjamin, who are from the south, want to choose a king based on who seems to be best suited, or who has the most talent, or who seems to be the best candidate for king, regardless of the relationship to Saul. So these two sides go to war with each other, and David, in the course of this conflict, continually shows generosity, mercy, solicitude, and wins over friends, particularly those in the north who were initially supportive of Saul's son. Ishbael has kind of the opposite personality. He's constantly looking around for enemies, spies, and um, cracks in his authority. And so eventually his lieutenants turn on him and assassinate him and turn to David. But just like the news of Saul's death, David does not greet Ishbaal's assassination with praise or thanks. He actually has the, the assassins executed. And then like Saul gives Ishbaal a proper burial, gives tribute to Ishbaal and you know, pays him his respects. So this is one of the marks of David that uh, even his enemies, he gives uh, proper respect and burial to because of their position. And Father Bartholomew remarks on this as kind of a shrewd uh, policy on David's part, because what is he doing? He's solidifying the legitimacy of the rulers in Israel, whether they're him or whether they're somebody else. If he brings about or celebrates the fact that people assassinate their rulers, then when he becomes ruler, that could very well turn on him, right? So he's laying down a precedent here that this sort of thing should be resisted, punished, and that when the leader of Israel dies, that he should be commemorated and given proper burial. So all the tribes of Israel unite around David and anoint him king. And it says in chapter 5, it's kind of interesting, that they make a covenant with David in the presence of the Lord. So it's not a covenant with God, but it's a covenant between the king and the people. And this could have two sides to it. Maybe they're making an agreement that's analogous to their agreement with God, or maybe they're making a covenant with a human being instead of making it with God. You have this tension in the kingship where are the people taking a king because the Lord is no longer their king? Or is the king the Lord's representative to the people? And so the people are to regard him as the Lord's uh, chosen one or representative. You have both of those strains, evidence for both of those positions in First and Second Samuel. So at the time David was made undisputed king of Israel, he was only 30 years old, very young. And he would rule Israel for another 40 years. And historically speaking, this is about 1000 to 960 BC. And by the way, in case you haven't noticed, uh, we've made a very clear transition since our days in Genesis, where you have stories of Noah and the Tower of Babel and these things that sound like very legendary stories. With Abraham, the haze begins to clear a little bit. and We begin to enter real human history. By the time we get to David, it is completely uncontroversial, undisputed. King David existed. This is the history that Israel act, actually lived. These were real events uh, being recounted, you know, in a particular way with particular embassy, certainly. But David was definitely a king of Israel. And uh, he definitely ruled for quite a long time. And there are archaeological remains that they are excavating right now in Jerusalem in the city of David that seem to confirm more and more David's influence upon the people of Israel. Okay, so God does make a covenant with David, however, even though there's this covenant between David and the people. And this happens around 2 Samuel 7. Uh, but before we can get to that, a couple pieces of context. One enormous piece of context. After uniting the tribes, in order to establish a unity, a central authority, David establishes a new political capital. And this is the founding or the, the uh, establishing of Jerusalem as the center, geographical center of the people of Israel. So the city at the time is called Zion. 
And it's held by this tribe called the Jebusites. Jebusites are not Israelites, so they're neither from the northern tribes <clears throat> nor from the southern tribes. So it's a city in the midst of Israel that is held by a foreign tribe, and so it's neutral. It belongs neither to the northern tribes nor to the southern tribes. So David and the Israelites capture this city, which was very small at the time, only about five blocks long, two blocks wide. It's on top of a mountain or promontory called Mount Zion. And David establishes as the capital because it's neutral and also because it's in between the northern and southern parts of where the tribes of Israel live. So it's very similar in some ways to our capital, Washington, D.C., a neutral zone that is not in any particular state, doesn't belong to any of our little tribes that we call states. And at the time it was founded anyway, it was founded specifically to be kind of between the northern and the southern states, which, you know, um, we're kind of at odds with each other from the very beginning of our country. He also establishes Jerusalem as the new religious capital of the people. He has the Ark of the Covenant brought from Shiloh to Jerusalem, and he has it brought in this uh, very elaborate procession. So the people are carrying the Ark on its poles, people are dancing, following it with palm branches, and uh, chanting psalms, and making a really big deal of this procession. David's rightful place in this procession is sort of on a, on a litter, you know, on a daze, on his throne, following in a very solemn way. That's what you would think a king would do in this procession, just sort of adding his authority to it. David doesn't do that. And it really shows something about David. He goes in front of the ark and leads the procession into the city and does so in a very unroyal and undignified way in some sense. He takes off his royal vestments and he dances before the ark. And some reflection leader says he was, he was dancing in ecstasy, you know, just sort of losing himself in the joy of the moment. And he was dancing so furiously that this, you know, undergarment under his royal vestment would sometimes come up and show his legs. And his wife, Michal, who was Saul's daughter, was very offended by this and rebukes David. So what sort of king are you? Why would you do this? I mean, you could imagine, like, say, a president of the United States sort of dancing furiously in front of a parade, uh, like in his undershirt and boxers or something like that. And you get a sense of what David was doing and why his wife was upset. But David didn't care. David was so lost in the joy and importance of the moment that he gave himself over to this dancing. And he actually rebukes her and basically says, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, you obviously uh, don't know that the Lord has chosen me instead of your father, Saul. And so I will gladly be lowly in your eyes, he says, but in the eyes of the slave girls you spoke of, I will be somebody. And um, so this created a rift between David and uh, this particular wife of his. So then we come to chapter seven, which is one of the most important verses in the Bible, I would say, at least for Christians, because here's where you have both the beginnings of the temple and also the covenant that the Lord makes with David, which is sort of the basis, the foundation, the bedrock of the messianic covenant that Christians believe Jesus Christ fulfills. So the covenant begins with David reflecting upon his grand palace, at the highest point in his city, in Jerusalem. And he says, you know, this really isn't right. I'm in this great palace, but the Ark of the Covenant is still in this portable tent that we took in the wilderness. We need to build a more fitting place for the Ark of the Covenant. Now there's something really beautiful and commendable about this because David's basically saying, I'm not the most important thing in this city. I'm not the most important person here. The Lord is more important than me and so should be given a much grander and greater place to dwell than me. And so his uh, royal prophet, Nathan, who we'll see becomes very important in the story, responds that the, the Lord tells Nathan to, to say to David, I have never dwelt in a house 
from this day, from the day I brought you up from Egypt to this day. But I've been going about in a tent or a tabernacle. As long as I've wandered among the Israelites, did I ever say any word to any of the judges whom I commanded to shepherd my people? Why have you not built me a house of cedar? So he's basically saying, it's okay. This is what I commanded you to build for me, and this is sufficient. But he also adds to it sort of to acknowledge the gesture that David makes. I will build you a house, David. I mean, you can build me a house if you want to or not. The tent is fine. But here's my promise to you. Here's my intentions to you. I will build you a house. The Lord will make a house for you. And this is when the Davidic covenant promises are relayed to him. I will raise up your offspring after you sprung from your loins. I will establish his kingdom. He it is who shall build a house for my name. And I will establish his royal throne forever. I will be a father to him. He shall be a son to me. Your house and your kingdom are firm forever before me. Your throne shall be firmly established forever. So what he means by house here isn't a physical building. It's the household of David, which refers to his dynastic house, his dynasty. So the house of David, meaning David's family, David's heirs, will rule Israel from this point forward forever. And this dynasty does last 400 years, which is a rather long time. But when it's broken, when it ends, the people of Israel then have to confront the question, well, how is God still fulfilling this promise that he made to David? And hence comes the idea of the Messiah, who would be the heir of David and would establish Israel's kingdom forever. Okay, so let's reflect a little bit on David's virtues. So who is David? He's a very strong, very striking personality. What sort of virtues or, or character traits mark him as uh, the, the sort of center figure of the people of Israel from this point on? I would say one is his humility. So he comes from a very low place. He's the youngest of eight sons, a lowly shepherd out working in the fields, and he becomes king of all the people. And he's always deferring to the Lord and pointing to the Lord's power, not his own, as the basis for his authority and success. He no doubt has a certain charisma about him, a presence, a way of speaking, a way of acting that really draws people. He's striking in appearance, but he's also at the same time very approachable. He forms these deep friendships. He's very likable. And he's also a very gifted uh, artist, musician, poet. There's a certain prowess that follows him. He's a very powerful warrior, very brave. Uh, very successful in the battlefield. He's killed his tens of thousands. And he proves to be a very competent leader of men. He establishes the nation of Israel and lays the foundation for their kingdom for the next uh, 400 years. He's very savvy, very shrewd, uh, maybe even manipulative to the point of being manipulative, some say. Uh, but he knows how to act politically to gain the friends and influences he needs, to stay in power, and to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. And he does accomplish much. He unifies the tribes, keeps them unified as well, and builds this nation of Israel, which comes to have significant uh, regional influence, at least. He also shows himself to be very loyal, uh, which I guess goes to his uh, ability of uh, friendship. He's a very devoted friend to both Jonathan and Nathan, and seems to anybody that he forms a friendship with, he remains loyal to them. And uh, as the end of the story comes to reveal, he's also a very loving and devoted father. So here's a little uh, couple maps to show you David's kingdom at its height. So the blue map shows you the kingdom that were directly under the tribes of Israel. And you see in the middle there with the star, the capital of Jerusalem, and where it stands, David's town is not very far from there, just south, Bethlehem. Uh, and they come to conquer territories, which include parts of the coastline, including Tyre and Sidon, which were traditionally Phoenician ports. Um, and the, kingdom also, the kingdom's influence also extends beyond 
this boundary. So the kingdoms of Edom, Moab, Ammon, and Aram, and even the Philistines uh, come to pay tribute to Israel and recognize them as the regional power. So you might even say they form like a, uh, an alliance, but they're recognized as kind of uh, subordinate to Israel. And they depend upon Israel's protection from surrounding enemies. So the area of his influence goes all the way um, well into Syria and all the way down into the uh, Gulf of Aqaba near the uh, Red Sea. David also has his failures, though, for all his successes. And, and one failure in particular stands out, which is called David's sin, or his sin with Bathsheba. And to sum it up, it's basically adultery covered up with deception and murder, and it's pretty bad. So the story in chapter 11 begins that with David staying home from battle while his army goes out to meet the enemy. And maybe he had a little too much time on his hands, didn't have enough to do. He begins rolling, strolling around on the roof. And while he's strolling on the roof, he happens to notice a woman nearby bathing. And he finds her very beautiful and takes her as his own. He sends for her to come and has sex with her and basically appropriates her. And here we might see echoes of Samuel's warning. He'll take your daughters, he'll take your livestock, he'll take your lands. Here's David taking someone else's wife just at his whim. And as you see in the picture on the right there, I mean, the whole thing is very creepy. There he is standing on his balcony, looking at this woman bathing, very voyeuristic, and uh, certainly reveals a side that's very unbecoming of David. So. He soon learns that Bathsheba, this woman that he took for his own, is pregnant with his child. So what's he going to do? Because Bathsheba's husband, Uriah the Hittite, was out at the battle that David probably should have been at. And so he sends for Uriah to come back to Jerusalem. And he says, uh, how's the battle going? Oh, um, by the way, why don't you go home and spend some quality time with your wife? Thinking, all right, well, they'll be together. And then if she has a child, then uh, Uriah will claim the child as his own because so oh, that one time I came back from battle. Oh yeah, that's where the child came from. But Uriah the Hittite refuses. He stays and stands guard at the palace. And when he does this, David knows that, you know, he's kind of screwed. And so he tells his commander, Joab, got to get rid of Uriah. So put Uriah at the front of the lines where the battle is fiercest. And then when the enemy converges on you, retreat immediately. Don't tell Uriah the plan. Leave him out hanging out to dry. And sure enough, Uriah is killed when they put this plan into motion. So David has Uriah killed, basically in order to cover up his adultery with Bathsheba. So it's a pretty grievous sin. And David doesn't seem to realize it until the prophet Nathan comes to tell him a story. It seems clear Dave, uh, Nathan, rather. Nathan knows what's happened. And he's coming to confront David about it. So he tells David this story. He says, there was this rich man who has lots of flocks and herds, you know, gazillion lambs, but... Next to him lives a poor man with only one beloved ewe lamb. And he sort of, he lays it on thick. You know, this, this poor man, he only had this one lamb and he cared for it. He fed it by hand and he snuggled with it. And it was his beloved only lamb. So the rich man has a guest. And instead of taking a, a lamb from his own flocks for his dinner, he takes the one beloved lamb of the poor man and serves it to his guest. So he has all of these lambs to choose from but he takes he steals basically the lamb of the poor man this makes david very angry now notice david is easily excitable and uh, stirred to justice here and he says that man deserves death the rich man and then you have this bombshell that nathan gives to david you are that man and very very powerful very skillful uh, rhetoric on nathan's part and it becomes clear to David how he himself deserves death for what he did, because he basically did the same thing. You know, he had all the wives he could want, and yet he takes the one beloved wife of a poor man instead of, of his own. So David immediately sees his sin and 
confesses it, the Lord says, well, I won't strike you down for this, but I am going to kill the child that you conceived with Bathsheba. And this breaks David's heart. And so he fasts and he prays. The child becomes sick and he sits in ashes, eats nothing, and prays for the child to get better. And again, prayer, prayer. He goes to God in prayer, pours out his heart. Uh, the child does eventually die, but David, you, you can see, is stricken by this. So even amidst his failures, he shows some positive qualities. Namely, he's able to be contrite. He's able to recognize his sins. He's receptive to criticism and rebuke. And he doesn't try to evade or make excuses for what he's done. He enters into, lays claim to his wrongdoings. And he turns to the Lord in that, fasting and praying for forgiveness. Again, he's also humble in the midst of his failures. Go back to one of his virtues. Even when Saul's pursuing him, he doesn't regard Saul as better or as, as worse than him. He could have, but he always defers to Saul's authority. He's able to recognize his own failures. He knows when to retreat when to see that he's made a mistake. And there's an interesting story at the end of 2 Samuel where he's fleeing from his son Absalom, who has organized the plot against him. And this nobody comes along and just starts berating him. And, and David's uh, men say, well, let, let me just go and kill that dog over there who's talking trash to you. And David says, no, don't do it. Because who knows what the Lord will say. I would rather endure this mockery unjustly uh, than to take vengeance now. For perhaps the Lord will take my part if I endure this mockery uh, in this state. So he's able to go to the lowest place when uh, he's in danger or in need. He also shows mercy in the midst of his failures or the failures of his family. He commemorates his fallen enemies. He comforts Bathsheba when she loses her child, their child. And when his son Absalom kills one of his other sons, Amnon, I mean, he's got a pretty dysfunctional family. So it was one son, Amnon, rapes one of his daughters. So you have incest there. I mean, they might have been from different mothers, perhaps. But uh, then his son Absalom gets mad at this because it was his sister. And so he kills Amnon and then has to flee for the murder. But when Absalom comes back, David uh, bends down and, and kisses his head and pardons him. So even for these horrible things that happen within his own family, he's able to show mercy and forgiveness. So it's the picture of David um, pardoning Absalom there on the right. And David also is able to wait and hope for his son Absalom, who rises up against him, trying to overthrow him, basically, uh, and hopes that he still might be reconciled to this rebellious son of his. And Father Bartholomew will say this really is what shows David's heart. And this is really, I think, the central thread throughout First and Second Samuel, this idea of God sees the heart, God values the heart, the heart is really what matters. David is called, as we saw before, a man after God's own heart. That's the kind of person that God chose to be Israel's king. Saw that in 1 Samuel 13. And it's echoed in the book of Acts in the New Testament. God testified concerning him, David. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. Now you can look at David's life and say, how could this guy be a man after God's own heart? You know, he's killing people. He's committing adultery and having others killed. He's constantly like conspiring and manipulating people. How could he be called a man after God's own heart? Well, Father Bartholomew weighs in on this. And he basically says, David's a man after God's own heart, not because he's perfect and holy and blameless, not even because he's consistently righteous or even a, a, above average in righteousness. He's a man after God's own heart because he doesn't allow his heart to harden. Remember, that's what was really uh, the problem with Pharaoh. His heart was hard. It was unable to be receptive, unable to feel, unable to be reached, unable to break. David's heart remains receptive, open, in dialogue with the Lord, receptive to others, and able to break. And that's what happens to him at the end of his life. 
when he finds out that his son Absalom was killed by his own army because Absalom was starting the second uh, uh, civil war, um, which would be followed by others. But this was a coup attempt, and they went out to meet Absalom's forces, and Absalom was killed. Um, kind of in a weird way, he uh, was riding under a tree and got his hair caught in one of the branches and was just sort of hanging there by his hair. He must have had quite a long hair. And then uh, his chief commander, Joab, kills him with a spear when he sees him vulnerable in that position. But when the news comes back that they've won the battle, the only thing David cares about is his son. What about my son? We've won the battle, we've won the battle. Yes, but what about my son, David says. And they say, may your enemies all end up like him. And then David is broken. He is undone. He, he goes away and weeps for his son. This is his moment of victory. You know, his, his authority is established. The civil war is resolved. But all he cares about is his own son. So here you see him abandoning his realpolitik manipulations. There's no ulterior motive here for his grief. He's just feeling the raw pain of a parent losing a child. No matter how rebellious that child is, uh, David shows himself here as loving that child with the heart of a father. And so Father Bartholomew would say, in David, the heart of the father reveals to us its depths. And he has this moving passage, which I wanted to quote in full at the end to conclude our lecture today, that David had to attain to that utter breaking of his heart so that there might rise to his lips those words, oh, my son, it's, it is really moving to end. He says, my son, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, would, I, would that I had died instead of you. And Father Bartholomew says, these are the words that well up in God's heart when he sees his sons choose death by refusing his love. So you see here, David's a man after God's own heart because he loves his son, even his rebellious son, to the point where he's willing to lay down his own life in order to save his son, even the most wayward. So this is where David's heart comes to reveal a glimpse of God's own heart and why he's called a man after God's own heart. Okay, so that's it for today. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you in class.